Hey, it's talking. It's talk gnosis. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a podcast about narcissism and esotericism. It's also a YouTube show. It's also about uh, narcissism and whatever else we feel like talking about that's connected to narcissism. Hey, <laughs> we've got Sky Marinda. Hey, Sky, how's it going? Hey, She's hey. uh. Hey, hi. Hey, Sky, who are you? Sum it up in a sentence. Oh, um, a terror reader, witch, and heretic. Yeah, there we go. That was really good. Nice. Uh, before we talk to this multidimensional being known as Sky Marinda, this uh, divine spark trapped in a human body who is sharing her gnosis with us tonight about tarot, Gnosticism, and whatever direction we go in and, and about her, her important work, first uh, comes the commercial for our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Gnostic. You get so many great things for signing up, like the show early, if if, if I remember to record it early and send it out. Look, we don't really give you anything, but you for, for as little as... I know this is not a good pitch if this is the first time you're listening or watching the show, but we don't want to lock up anything behind a paywall because it makes us feel icky, but we need money to do the show, so we're, we're in a bit of a bind, a bit of a paradox here. Uh, so for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, we usually charge for five or six pieces of media. We try to make more than that. You can... Uh, uh, keep the show going. You can also donate more. You can also put a cap on that if you're scared we're going to make a million pieces of media. Uh, you can also do one-time donations by going over to paypal.com slash Gnostic. Uh, yeah, we do give the show early. I'm going to start uh, doing more contests for the, Patreon, for the Patreon. I'm going to start sending uh, the review books that people send us. Obviously, I'm going to read them first, but be careful not to bend the spine. I'm going to give those out to people. And if you have some idea about what we can do for you, like if you want Jason and I to, to go over and shovel your driveway if you if you want me to text you uh if you ever want to talk on the phone late at night <laughs> just let us know what we can do for you for your money and we'll do it uh within reason okay <laughs> You can also help us out by telling people about the show, sharing it on social media. All jokes aside, uh, unfortunately, um, the 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 hellish archons that love uh, that 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 hate us and, and rule our lives, uh, which are the the algorithms, uh, do really push up if you're liking, subscribing, reviewing. So do that. Also tell people about the show. Just take an episode, send it to a pal, all that good stuff. Okay, it's over. We're doing it. Sky, how did you discover Gnosticism? It was kind of serendipitous, probably like for most people. Um, let's see. So I had a dream about a pink full moon and I was like, what's this about? So I looked it up and someone said it was about Mary Magdalene. And I don't know if this is like real or like has historical precedence, but I'm okay with it now because I, looked up the Gospel of Mary, and I know now it's not technically Gnostic, or people kind of debate it, but I like that it has the word Gnostic in it when you search it, because that's what made me be like, okay, let's see what else is out there about Gnosticism. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know about that connection. I'm going to look it up afterwards. And actually, my opinion is that the, the Gospel of Mary as well as the Gospel of Thomas are both Gnostic. But that that's for another show. So there you go. We'll, we'll rephrase it. Mary Magdalene reached down to pull you into Gnosticism. Uh, Sophia herself manifesting as, as a pink moon. Um, you, uh, uh, you're also interested in other things. So, uh, as many of us are, but you know, the esoterica, so witchcraft, uh, tarot, coaching. How do you combine uh, an interest in, in this specific heresy with, with, with these other heresies? Yeah, I think it's just like an addition. Like, they don't compete for me at all. Um, it's just like adding more mythology and adding more modalities and more practices. So I think they go together really well. I did have that crisis for a while where I was like, well, is this all gonna fit? What do I call myself? Where do I belong? But it's just like, you can just be a bunch of different things. So it's okay. Yeah, I, I, I think that we definitely agree. What do you think, Jason? He's muted, wait. Oh, dang. Um, the Archons were fighting me there. Um, yeah, no, I think it's the, that that uh, um, that mixing process and that discovery process is like the the best way. 
Yeah. And, yeah. You, you know, there's just lots of intersections. There's, there's sort of a hidden history of Nazism, which we'll go into someday on the show, which is <laughs> sort of what the, uh, no, I, I'm serious, which is, which is, there's this idea with, with our, with our ancestors in the 1800s uh, and nearly the 20th century, that now doesn't seem very scholarly, that, you know, Nazism is a secret river that, that really feeds all the occult traditions. And, and that's not quite true, but I've recently become, aware of or embrace some arguments and really does see a lot of connections between the ancient Gnostics and the, the sort of modern esotericism, uh, cool stuff like tarot, cool stuff like witchcraft, cool stuff like other esoteric bodies of thought. And, and of course, the, the Gnostics of the, of the 1900s, uh, the Gnostics of the uh, 1800s, you know, the, the 18th and 19th century, then 20, early 20th century, uh, uh, were part of what was called the occult revival. So the, they were very much into stuff like like tarot and uh, the precursors to to modern uh, witchcraft and all this neat stuff. So the, there is already some some organic crossover there. But uh, put a pin in that for a future show. We're not talking to me. We're talking to you, Sky. Sky. <laughs> You you write about uh, religious trauma. You work with people with religious trauma. Um, I'm going to speak for Jason because I think he agrees with me. I said we in our question sheet. But I, I we feel that Gnosticism, the Gnostic mythology, is particularly powerful when it comes to working through issues that people may ha have from their own lives uh, and culture, society, their families, dealing with, number one, Christianity. I would say religion in general, because obviously the Gnostic mythology, the, the majority that we have remaining is a specific spin and inversion of, of Christianity. But I, I would argue that that many forms of religion can be interrogated through a Gnostic lens. And it's also a way to come back to religion and work out religious trauma. That That's what we think. Sky, what, what do you think? Yeah, totally. I mean, I grew, I thought I grew up in a normal, like, mainline church and over the pandemic I started digging into it and I was like oh no the one I grew up in is pretty like different it's pretty fundamentalist and I was like that's wild I thought <laughs> I thought my experience was pretty normal and so like when people would say the word like God or Jesus to me it was like flames out of my ears like I was so angry um, mostly because the one I grew up in, like women weren't allowed to talk at all, really. Like you could heat up food afterwards or watch kids mm -hmm. in the nursery and that was it. Like you couldn't do any sort of like leadership or assisting. So like, especially I keep, I'm probably going to talk about the gospel of Mary a lot because it Please. is like, so like, I was like, oh my gosh, like they didn't listen to her either. Like this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it got me to a point where I could like hear the word God and not immediately be like, the whole thing is terrible. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I actually really like, and, and for a while now, basically since it's been translated and circulating in the 70s, a lot of people outside of Gnosticism or outside of the, even the Christian world have really embraced the Gospel of Mary because you have those those great sequences, which is basically, you know, Mary speaking and teaching and the apostles and Peter being like, well, you shut up, you're a woman, right? <laughs> where where she actually knows more than them. Jesus has entrusted her with with special uh, teachings that, that those dummy men are around her whose little uh, boy pea brains were, wouldn't have been able to process, right? There's a reason why Jesus gave, gave them to her. Um, so it, it's really a remarkable text for that. And of course, there's just great sequences where it's like, uh, they ask her about sin, right? And there is no sin. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I, I have found, you know, kind of people in goddess movements, uh, people in the more new age communities, what have you, ha have also been very moved, been moved by this, this powerful text. But, um, and you know, I, I grew up in a, actually in a very nice, gentle mainline, uh, Christian church, uh, a very progressive one, which, which I still really love. I've mentioned this on the show before, but it just wasn't right for me. Um, and I have my own issues, you know, working through, uh, with Christianity and, and I have nothing to complain about. So, so I can't imagine someone with a background, um, act, which is, of course, many of us uh, in the West uh, who, who have actually belonged to a community that may not have been very healthy. So um, I think uh, to maybe like add into your 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 rant there, too, I think like that's often what's made Gnosticism exciting uh, is because it's it's a way to reapproach some of these images and and uh, mythologies without. Uh, uh, 
without having to accept absolutely everything that came from your background. Yeah. Um, uh, and you, in a way you can kind of find the piece that fits best for you and embrace that. Um, uh, and also, I mean, frankly, just the fun of being uh, a heretic, you know what I mean? Like the, it's like the tapping into that, like that punk aesthetic, you know, um, yes. like we're like, you were like scripture punk. <laughs> um, uh, but and, uh, yeah, so sorry, what were you going to say, well, there, Jonathan? I'm just going to say, and you famously like aren't wild about the Jesus stuff, right? So, well, and it's not even that I'm not like, like I, I don't want to overplay it. It's like I'm not. It just doesn't jazz me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Especially the the a lot of the the mainline representations of it. I just don't doesn't excite me doesn't doesn't get me interested and actually on, i i don't want i want to keep on sky here i don't want to go too much on my own path yes uh, for yeah. this show but but i think one thing that i've been finding interesting is i've been trying to engage more with the the what i what has like what i find interesting about gnosticism is that gnosticism is almost defined by mysteries um whereas a lot of uh, the mysteries they definitely exist in, in mainline christianity but they're not sort of front and center as the main thing that you're supposed to think about, you know? Um, that's debatable, but <laughs> I'm sure there's people wincing right now who are who are watching or listening to this. But to connect to tarot, I think part of what I find so fascinating about tarot is that it's, again, defined by, it presents you with a mystery, you know? That you're, like, the part of the process is, like, decoding. Um, so I think maybe that's kind of my way to try to how uh, ask about your own, Sky, your own connection to how uh, tarot and Gnosticism might might meld for you. Yeah, well, when you look at the major arcana, right, where it's like the fool and there's all sorts of like the lovers, the chariot, and it goes all the way through 21 cards to the world at the end, and it's known as the fool's journey. I mean, that fits really well within Gnosticism because you're looking at it as like your soul development or like your personal development towards the world card which is i mean i really associate the world card with sophia you're going through all these trials to get back there um yeah i think that answers the question <laughs> i i think it does and again there's there's a bit of a push and pull between are we reading into this is this stuff here and does it matter but but i i think anybody who knows any any idea about Sophia embodies uh, personalized wisdom as the the soul of the world, right? Which is an mm -hmm. idea not just found in Gnosticism that medieval philosophers were talking about, even if they're not talking about Sophia in the specific Gnostic mythology, right? So if you're thinking about this figure sort of floating around uh, medieval Europe, appearing in other works uh, as the soul of the world, well. You know, this is obviously the world card, right? And she is surrounded by the four uh, elements. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could, you know, like, and she is, she, you know, just like we have, just like she's in us as our soul. She is, uh, uh, has that element of being the world. Um, so uh, the, the Gnostic read in there is is not, I would say, strictly a read in. Uh, <laughs> we are we are dealing with with a figure that other people in the medieval world that the tarot came out of would have recognized as Sophia. Maybe not quite the Gnostic Sophia, but kind of platonic, uh, uh, mystical ruminations. Um, so I think I really think you're spot on there, Sky. And, and of course, I'm always open for the possibility that the tarot is a secret underground Gnostic encodement of of the, the hero's journey. You know, I, I don't know if that's literally true or if there was secret underground Gnostics putting that together to keep the wisdom alive, which we've had some some guests uh, hypothesize, uh, but at the same time, it it, it is a uh, a mystical uh, guide to to Western magic, um, to uh, Western speculation. There's always going to be a little taste of, of Gnosticism in there. So I, yeah. I, 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 oh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to 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 kind of. So on one hand, we've talked about like the possibility for tarot to encompass Gnosticism. Um, uh, but I also want to kind of go the other way. Like there's the, like sometimes the complaints say about say astrology is that according to some Gnostic worldviews, astrology is information coming from the world you're trying to escape or the world you're trying to, you know, uh, not be held down by. Um, is there, is that a, um, uh, a useful or interesting critique into tarot and Gnosticism? Like, is there, you know, is the, 
is tarot like a, a way that that wisdom cracks in through or is tarot a um uh like telling you the the way the world is currently oppressing you or is it both can it be both yeah i think of a, a tarot especially maybe the minor arcana where it's like like the three of swords like heartbreak or like betrayal like those more like things that are happening in your life those to me i think of as like your personal archon and you kind of mm, have to mm. work through them so it's not so much about like well the way i do it it's not so much about like predicting things or getting information and that way it's more like knowing yourself and being like oh yeah i'm kind of like lying to people again i should probably not do that <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting personal archons i like that a lot yeah well i i think personalizing it like this is is the best way to make it practical and useful right the mythology can can only take you so far if you see it as as exterior mythology which you know the, the gnostics write a lot that as above so below you, this, this is a reflection of what's going on inside of you as well and and whether that is symbolic literal a mix of both if you do not bring it back to what's going on with you then uh it's it's not going to quote unquote work it's not going to, you're not going to be able to get anything out of it or whatever you're trying to get out of it mm -hmm. um yeah, but I, I really do like this. And, you know, we've talked about tarot a fair amount on the show, but not as much as I'd like in some ways. But, <laughs> um, Sky, do do you see it as, as being quote-unquote magic? And like, or, like, I know you just said this, but if you could kind of draw it out. Or, or is, it, is, it a, is, is it just a tool for self-discovery? Or is it something in between? Like, like the, how, how do you, quote-unquote, how do you think tarot works? How do you use it with your clients? Um, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Give, lay it on <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I used to be a little bit or more like, oh, let's not use it for predicting. And now I'm kind of more open to it. Like, yeah, sometimes that could be really nice to predict things and feel like we know what's going to happen. Um, but I do think it's more helpful to be like, OK, this is where I'm at. So like, what can I do to get to where I actually want to go? And I use it a lot with intentions because you're like looking at the, the cards and you're getting like, archetypes and ideas about what you're doing and what you could be doing so i kind of like mix all that up into an intention um yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh just give me one moment here okay uh uh for those uh, watching at home, you'll notice that Jason is gone. His uh, cash is tearing up his apartment. I don't know if he's... <laughs> for those watching at home uh, and not listening, Sky has her Christmas tree behind her. I don't know what Jason's going to do when he gets his, uh, with his cat chaos. So... He, he will be he will beam back in from the pleroma but in the meantime let's talk a, a, a bit about your um, your coaching work so <coughs> excuse me I actually just got back uh, the part of my income is from meditation coaching and you know, something I, I talk a lot about in mindfulness and meditation is is self-compassion I was wondering if that's part of your work if that's a topic that comes up uh, with coaching and if you think that self-compassion is especially needed in these these very bizarre numbers times that we live in yeah for sure i mean compassion and self-compassion to me are like two sides of the same coin and they're both super important because they go out the window so fast like it's like the i should be doing more i'm not doing well like all those feelings and i get a lot of people who just kind of need some reassurance that they're on the right track or they're doing a good job and I don't know, maybe it's like our culture, social media, all of that, where it's like we're not getting that kind of message where it's like, hey, you're doing a good job. Yeah, exactly. And with with the self-compassion stuff, and, you know, this is something that I really ponder uh, and think about is is we live in, in, in very also, I, I would say, times where we are forced to be an individual, very individualistic times. And so how do we stop self-love and self-compassion from becoming self-centered and narcissistic? Yeah, definitely can. Um, I think it's that balance of, it's also like the great symbiotic relationship that self-compassion and compassion have. Like they go back and forth. Like if you're being more compassionate to other people, you tend to be more compassionate towards yourself 
like a weird example of this is like I used to not like have a great relationship with my dad and when I was able to like have compassion for him as a person and be like okay like I don't think I think some things he did weren't great but like I can appreciate just that he's another human being going through stuff I stopped like hating my jawline <laughs> like yeah. I didn't I thought it was very surprising to me I used to be like oh my jaw looks like his jawline and I hate that I don't have a nice chiseled jawline and this is something that like every time I looked in the mirror it bothered me and then like after I was able to like have compassion for him it's like I didn't care anymore um and so it's kind of like this cool thing of like if you're extending it and having fashion for yourself it like goes back and forth it's like a back and forth relationship yeah, I, I, I that's been my experience as well, and it, it's almost startling. Um, and both both with myself and, and with some of my coaching. Uh, I mean, I know you're the guest. I'm not talking about me, but I'm trying to bring this in to <laughs> to, uh, to 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 agree with you that experientially uh, that I have encountered this. That paradoxically, our our self compassion becomes less narcissistic when we realize that when we are compassionate with ourselves, it allows us to access the other, the big other, other people. Would you agree with that summation? I, I don't necessarily want to take your words and twist them if, if, if that's not, uh, if, if, if that's not a, a point that you were trying to make. <laughs> no, I think, I think I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it really is. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we do need, um, specific practices, meditation practices. And, you know, the, the, some of that, uh, um, we always want to talk about all, all this uh, deep mysticism and uh, awesome esoteric witchy things that you could do under moonlight. But, you know, there's a reason why Jesus tells us to pray for our enemies. Um, and doing this sort of spiritual practice uh, when we're thinking about others, projecting love and compassion to the others, uh, you know, for those, who, for those who are doing stuff like metta and loving kindness meditation, uh, it can be, is very soothing for the self. Um, letting go of our hate and anger and thinking about others and praying for others is very soothing and then changes our relationship to others. So, yeah, it's uh, again, uh, it sounds like a paradox, but yeah. our, we, we come home to ourselves. We show ourselves self-compassion and then we, uh, when we orient, orient the other in, a, in our thoughts and in our heart, uh, we feel compassion both for them and us. Uh, yeah, and you know. Uh, oh, sorry. No, you go ahead, Sky. <laughs> I was gonna say you can do it in like a sassy way too. Like you don't have to be like pure and like great about it. Like when I when people aren't wearing masks around me, it makes me so angry. And like I'll just feel like, um, Mary, help me have compassion for this person because like I don't want to smack them in the face right now. <laughs> <laughs> like my common prayer. <laughs> no, that, that, that is a good one. I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that. That is gonna be my no new spiritual practice. Mary, give me patience so I don't smack them in the face. Uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, there's there's the whole gospel summed up into one simple prayer. Uh, Jason, what were you gonna say? Well, I I also just want to echo. I think the the notion of of radical compassion for people that you might otherwise have a like that 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 actually bring out anger is it's like one of the hardest things to do, you know, it's, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, uh, well, and, and to connect to this idea of compassion and empathy, uh, and to also tarot, <laughs> to kind of bring that back in too, is that, uh, so Sky, have you ever had a, an experience reading for somebody where that reading feels like it's kind of for you too, like where you're getting kind of a mutual, like, you know, as you're kind of explaining it to somebody, you're like, oh, that's actually, that's just a good point. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah all the time or i'll just feel like oh yeah i totally relate to this like i have been doing this lately i'm trying to give it a specific example but yeah it's like oh yeah i should um stop being so hard on myself uh also you too let's let's both do that <laughs> yeah yeah exactly oh. yeah oh yeah oh, I, I was just going to add to that jason which mm. is to say that any any good any good coach, and, and you know, I'm not an expert, and, and I don't have that much experience, and I don't want to make this narcissistic or self-centered, because if you're getting paid to help people, you're there for them. But but I think if you're ever playing a role like this, if you're not also learning, then then you're doing something wrong, you know. And this is because I, I find with whenever uh, whenever I do do stuff, uh, gnostic stuff as as a deacon, 
Um, and and uh, Jason's quite familiar with, with sort of the the model in our community of which is not we're gurus. It's a model of spiritual friendship. So I, I learn so much from others whenever we do parish activities here in Montreal, and I learn so much from others whenever I'm running meditation courses. And I feel like, of course, I don't want to be there to you know demand something from the other, expect something from the other, get something from the other. But I feel like if I'm not open to learning, open from growing from the process, then uh, then then I'm doing something wrong. Does, does that sound right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, it's just also acknowledging that you don't have, or we don't have all the answers to. It's like, I'm not like perfect, like, oh yes, everyone do what I'm doing, because I know, like, it's like, oh yeah, like, I'm totally like doing the same thing as you, like, cool, let's both be working on this. <laughs> Hmm. And probably beware, uh, beware any coach or guru who, um, uh, who betrays no weakness, if that makes sense. Um, cause that's yeah. probably the person who's just chock full of archons. <laughs> <laughs> I have an image now, just like a mouth opening and like archons flying out. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's kind of like, that's badass. <laughs> yeah. Like artists at home right sketch it out and leave it in the comments exactly yeah that almost feels like it like a neil gaiman image um if that makes sense something out of the the sandman comics or something um uh sorry i was i was moving into a question there but then i forgot what it was when with that great great image um uh what was oh shoot something about tarot oh tarot. Uh, no it's actually tarot or not, was it something about tarot or narcissism well yes. i <laughs> tarot specifically actually uh, okay. in this case well so yeah like i think we've kind of we've we've gone in a, a few like general directions but i think on just on even a practical level uh in terms of just you as a tarot professional as a tarot expert um what uh what's your your tarot practice like is it a daily thing is it a like is it a card a day that kind of thing no not at all i think i'm like most people where when i'm trying to make a decision or when like something is not going well I like go for it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it'd probably be good to do daily, but I don't even recommend daily both to other people because, like, I'm like, yeah, I only do it when I need it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Sky, you, you mentioned the world card, but do you see some other kind of Gnostic archetypes, figures from Gnostic mythology embedded in the tarot cards, be they there originally or be they, be they a read-in? Yeah, I love to speculate on which, like, what cards could be what. I mean, I talked about, like, the personal archons of the miners, but there's also, like, the personal aeons, I would say, you know, like, the Ten of Cups, where there's, like, a rainbow, and everyone's, like, happy. Um, like, there can be positive things in there, too. And I think it's fun to speculate on what the Demiurge could be, right? Because that's, like, a favorite character in the mythology. And I was like, it's almost too obvious, right? To be like, oh, it's the devil card. Like, it's yeah. gotta be more interesting than that. But I think it's actually good. I think the devil card fits because the way I see the devil card is that it's us getting in our own way. It's like that little like self sabotage thing we all do. And that's kind of how I see the Demiurge, right? Because as much as Sophia is a part of us, the Demiurge is a part of us. And it's just kind of like acknowledging that. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. And, and unfortunately, you know, I, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but I 100% agree with you, right? I'd like to have a more interesting take. Uh, if someone's like, <laughs> oh, you know, because I'm sure if we if we hand a tarot deck over it to anyone, it'd be like, who's... who? Who's the who's the demiurge in, the, in this collection of figures? Yeah, I think ninety nine point nine percent of people uh, would say the the devil card, but they'd be right. You know, so so sometimes the fancy, elaborate, uh, clever answers aren't always the most correct. Um, Sky, uh, what do you think many people misunderstand or quote unquote get wrong about tarot? Um, I think they just misunderstand or go into it thinking that the best part of it will be predicting things and they just um miss the cool part of it that can be like the alchemical looking at yourself self-reflection self-growth 
part of it um, versus like, does this person like me or not? I get that question a lot, which I love it. It's very, it's very sweet. Um, <laughs> I'm always just like, well, why don't you go ask them out or ask them if they like you? That's kind of the only, that's the only surefire way to know. So we can like look at Tara and be like, okay, like, well, we'll help. What do you have to work through to like get the courage to like ask them out? Right. And of course, you know, th th that's advice I'd probably give someone with, even without a, a deck of tarot cards, yeah. right? <laughs> which just, just go ask them. But but maybe it does, again, for this this creative push and pull. Is it real? Is it not real? What is real? Like, like maybe some people do need that tarot deck in front of them to have that courage, right? To, to have you guide them, uh, even though, you know, that that's probably good advice. But do, do the tarot cards, you feel like the tarot cards tell you to go like, tell the person just to say, hey, do you like me or do you want to go out? Have you ever gotten a reading where it's like, oh, the cards definitely say they like you? <laughs> I'm, sometimes I will be like, okay, like honestly, a lot of these cards are really good. So like, I'm just going to put that out there. But, <laughs> but I don't like to label them good or bad, but some, you know, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so sometimes, sometimes it's just like, okay, like, you should also just ask them out, but it's looking a little good, so. <laughs> Uh, Sky, you're uh, so, so Jason. Jason's fifty six. I'm forty eight. We're what? Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, we look good for our age, but you're the, you're a hip happening Zoomer. So I, I'm no. Are you I'm a hip happening millennial. millennial? Oh, you're a yeah. hip happening millennial. So um, what? <laughs> Particularly for for maybe young people online, for uh, for those exploring, do, do you have any advice for exploring Gnosticism? If people are curious about the Gnostic traditions, about Gnosticism, anything that you would tell them? Well, I would tell them to listen to the show. But um, oh, thank you. It's true. You. Um, but yeah, I think also just listening to. Hmm, well, I listen to them because I don't read physical books because neck issues. But, you know, listening to the trans different translations of the Gospels, just because it's also really fascinating, even if you decide you're not into it. Um, what else? <laughs> I don't know. I think that's it. <laughs> I, I, I think that's great advice, and uh, and I think that's um, awesome. And, you know, there's something powerful about listening to the Gnostic Gospels be read out loud, uh, and the 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 Willis Barnstone translation of the Gnostic Bible is available as uh, as an audiobook. And actually, the different translations is also very important. You know, not to give people homework, but hey, it's fun, right? Especially <laughs> if you're listening to them, uh, because wow, there there's some real differences. And you know, the, the scriptures weren't translated to the 70s, and then they were they were pretty clunky those first you know this is new stuff in some ways the 70s wasn't that long ago you know jason and i were young men then and uh <laughs> the, the uh, uh. So they were very scholarly translations that that um, that that that, are, that still are important because you are getting some of the best scholars in the world. But sometimes the language is cl is quite clunky, right? It doesn't sing. And then you have the more poetic translations, but maybe they miss some of the subtleties, or maybe they're a little they lean too much into the poetry over uh, the, maybe the best, most authentic term that may get across what's going on. So I, I think that's really really good advice. Um, but I never really thought about that, you know, outside of next issues or whatever right like so many people involved specifically agnostic groups are just read 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 what have you read what are you reading this is what i'm reading you should read this but th these texts were originally recited out loud um so I, I think there is a power uh both listening to them and we talked about the show before uh the, um, talking about another amazing gnostic divine text thunder perfect mind you know go you know tear off your clothes go up on a hill under a full moon and shout that one out right it's it's think, very powerful when you do it out loud uh i think ridley scott's daughter made a short film for prada or for like a um uh so like a, a fragrance or something like that she, she made a short film and like you can you can find it on youtube and it's a it's like it's probably the it's it's something i often hand to people to show them gnosticism or to show them what gnosticism can be uh, without getting them to have to read very much or even watch very much because it's like five minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it, it encompasses a lot of the mysteries and then makes some makes somebody maybe interested to dig a little deeper on the on the mysteries. Yeah. yeah. I, it also made me think of like 
maybe just more broad like Christian mysticism has been really mm. cool to study and incorporate because I like you know Protestant I don't know any of the saints like I'm still trying to I'm like okay what's Advent like I don't know what's going on um so <laughs> you like, and me both. I, <laughs> <laughs> so I got a rosary and I use it more like prayer beads but um yeah just kind of like reincorporating the symbolism that I and like in a way that's like resonates with me yeah. Mm. I, 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 that's something that, that's very powerful for me, having a, a low Protestant um, church background. And, I, you know, I, and again, I really like the church I grew up in, but I, I guess my rage is against the wider Protestant movement because I feel almost a rage, right? Like I feel <laughs> angry that they stole the saints from me, that they stole a lot of the holidays from me, that they stole my mom, right? Mary from me, right? Um, that all these all these important figures are, are just, I mean, you know, the, you can still find them in the background sometimes, but, um, uh, and you know, in our particular tradition, it's very churchy, it's very churchy Gnosticism. And we combine sort of high church mysticism and practices. We look very Catholic or Anglican or Episcopalian or high Lutheran to, to people who may know those traditions. Um, so you, we do a lot with the saints. We do a lot with the smells and the bells. And it, it's been very powerful for me to embrace that, even though I think there's sometimes a voice at the back of my mind because I was raised in the United Church of Canada, which is similar to the United Church of Christ in the U.S., um, but, you know, my grandparents were Presbyterian, right, very strict Presbyterians, so uh, that, you know, they're rolling over in their graves anytime I pray with and to a saint, but uh, there's still a bit of that voice that I have to, I have to drown out because it's it's been, I think, very, very powerful for me, so... Um, uh, let's see. Okay, you know what? We, we, we should start wrapping up because unfortunately we, we have to cut a, sh a little bit short tonight. Uh, Jason has to has to has to run. He has an important live stream event. Uh, so uh, we'll get into uh, the uh, uh, the final questions here. Uh, Sky, so we ask your advice for those starting off with Gnosticism, looking into Gnosticism. What's your advice for those new to tarot, starting off with tarot? Um, I really like the book. 78, 78 degrees of wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, it really goes into things as looking at the cards as personal development. So that's a great resource. And then the other way to get started is just to look at the cards for a while, maybe like think what you think it means. And then you can cross reference it like on Google, see what other people are saying about it, see what other books are saying about it and kind of like come to your own understanding or definition of it. Um, you don't have to keep other people's definitions. There's plenty of cards that I read totally different from other people. So there's like, there's not necessarily rules for tarot. You can get kind of creative, which is why I like it. Very cool. Uh, Jason, any closing questions or, or thoughts? Uh, no, well, I just, I just think that the point there about um uh like looking at the card like letting that be step one <laughs> of understanding tarot is like because i think that that's what makes it so great is that uh it's um like good decks are don't need uh if they're doing the if they're doing their job correctly you don't need a uh a concordance or a book or a even a like a, a an encyclopedia or anything to understand it you can see oh like that person's got a bunch of swords in their back that's got to suck like <laughs> or that tower is falling down. That sounds like, you know, that's in, something seems like there's might be, you know, the situations are breaking down kind of thing. Like it's, uh, it's um, in a way it's actually kind of, it's almost like graphic novels where there's a um, really emphasizing the power of the image to com convey something complicated, I think is uh, uh, really valuable. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's the thing I just wanted to jump on on that train there. Um, yeah. I think that's about it for me. Okay. Uh, Sky Miranda, uh, we are flashing your plugs up on the screen, but uh, some people listen to this as a podcast. Some people pop on the YouTube and they wash the dishes and they're not looking at our glorious, beautiful faces. So tell people at home where they can find you, where they can hire you, where they can get coaching from you, where they can uh, the read your writings online, all that good stuff. Yeah. So I'm on Instagram, basically everywhere at Sky Miranda. It's like Mary, but with an I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm on YouTube and Twitter. So wherever you like to be, I'm probably there. Fantastic. We'll also uh, link that up in the show notes for those looking. Uh, Jason, any plugs before we depart? 
Uh, just the usual ones. Uh, the theater company that I work for, DJ Memo. Oh my gosh. Um, uh, the theater company I work for, uh, uh, Sage Theater. We're doing a uh, live stream in about uh, ten minutes here, <laughs> so you're probably not going to see that because you're not listening to this or watching this um, on the same day that we're doing this, December sixth. But you can go to sagetheater.com and get uh, a lot of the content that we've been making. We're making it, releasing it digitally now, which is good. Uh, in fact, what's happening here in about ten minutes is a dance film that we made of a mm. bunch of dancers that and uh, movement uh, artists that we brought together in a space back in the when things were okay to do that for even with uh, where COVID was, um, everybody was very safe, but uh, it was really exciting to make something that sort of felt live, if that makes sense. It uh, felt like a live event. For sure. So. Yeah. For sure. Very exciting. Well, everybody check that out at home. Uh, my plug is mylandmeditation.substack.com. As I mentioned previously, I do some professional work as a meditation coach, but this is free. This is uh, <laughs> my free Sunday morning meditation. It's so I can give back a bit. I was doing it in person here in Montreal. Uh, now I'm doing it online. When things reopen fully here, it'll be both in person and online. Uh, so it's a great secular, open to everybody, not specifically not mindfulness meditation 11 a.m uh, new york time montreal time the eastern time whatever you want to call it uh so <laughs> check out all the details there at violetmeditation.substack.com uh sky marinda thank you so much thanks for having me it was a real pleasure <laughs> bye